Okay, welcome to Club Have Med Conversations. My name is Bernie Crespi. I'm filling in for the illustrious Charlie Nunn today, who is on uh, sabbatical. As most of you know, the goal of Club EVMED is to connect the evolution community together and to share and discuss exciting new research. We try to keep Club EVMED as uh, informal as possible with an emphasis on, on conversation, that is uh, discussion and presentation of different perspectives from the participants. Club EVMED is organized by the International Society for Evolution Medicine and Public Health. It is always a great time to be a member. It may be tax deductible, I'm not sure, but you, you do get a discount on the page charges uh, and the meeting attendance if you are a member. And remember, of course, to keep the journal EMPH in mind when you are uh, considering places to submit your your uh, fine work. During the presentation uh, today, we encourage you to uh, ask your questions by posting them into the uh, chat box during the presentation. Okay, and otherwise uh, you can hold them until the end and and raise your virtual uh, virtual hand, and we will find your your question uh, that way. Also feel free to tweet about Club Med. Today is the second in a series of three talks on evolutionary perspectives on health disparities. Our speaker is Dr. Jonathan Wells from the University College uh, London, where he is a professor of anthropology and pediatric uh, nutrition. So I'm going to turn it over to John. Take it away. Right, so hopefully you can all see my screen. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, um, uh, make this presentation. Um, so this is a paper that just came out recently in um, Evolution, Medicine and Public Health, um, specifically trying to uh, look at um, health inequalities and social inequality from the um, perspective of dynamic game theory. Now, how do I advance my, here we go. Um, so I work on nutrition and health through the life cycle. So I'm interested in maternal and child nutrition, and then as infants and children grow into adolescence and become the next generation of adults. Um, as soon as we look at nutritional outcomes, we find that we see a lot of social inequality. This is just one example, the English population. You can see very nutritional outcomes there like preterm birth um, and short stature in childhood, but those are closely connected with just longevity, life expectancy and so on. And here we've got the uh, 10 deciles of uh, deprivation and you can see social gradients between the poorest uh, groups and the wealthiest groups. And when we talk about interventions, very often we target these interventions at what we think of as the high risk groups, the poor groups. And I want to argue in this, in, uh, in this presentation that this is really the wrong approach. It's not likely to be successful. So what I'm going to talk about is something that I developed at length in this book, The Metabolic Ghetto, an evolutionary perspective on nutrition, power relations and chronic disease. Um, what I tried to do in that book was argue that if we really want to understand health inequalities, we need to bring together an understanding of our physiology, our evolutionary biology, and also an understanding of societal dynamics. And we need to bring all of those three things together, because it's only when we put them all on the same page that we'll really see uh, what we need to address with our health interventions. So I'm going to be focusing on food systems, and food systems isn't something that's anything unique to humans. Um, this is a food system, uh, two parents are cooperating on providing uh, food for their offspring. When we think about human food systems, if we think from a long-term evolutionary perspective, we know that uh, for most of our evolutionary history, we were hunters and gatherers. So we can learn a lot, perhaps, at looking at modern-day uh, hunter-gatherer hunter -gatherer populations to think about their societies as food systems and how that relates to their health. 
And if we do that, we often tend to emphasize um, the egalitarian nature of such societies. Um, the book by Sarah Blaver Hurdy, Mothers and Others, uh, described very nicely all sorts of different cooperative relationships that mothers may draw on to help rear their offspring. And if that's something about our long-term evolutionary past, then maybe we can look further back to shared common ancestors and gain insight to that by studying living primates. And so you see articles like this, chimps have an innate sense of fairness. So this is very nice. These are the positive aspects of social relationships. But there are other sides of society which are slightly less positive, and that takes us to look at inequality. It was a very nice uh, special issue in current anthropology in 2010, looking at uh, wealth inequality in different types of population and, and trying to understand how wealth inequality had changed uh, between different uh, types of, of society. And that relates also to the uh, topic of niche construction. Um, so how we actually construct societies that have inequality as a component of the human niche. And uh, an article that was very relevant to what I'm talking about just came out uh, by uh, Paula Henry and colleagues about um, embedded racism as an inequitable niche uh, in human society. So what I'm interested in is all the negative aspects of human society, relations of inequality and exploitation. Um, I wanted to develop a really broad generalizable model of inequality that could be used to study different types of inequality, whether that's gender inequality, racialized societies, socioeconomic inequality, or global geopolitics. And what I want to argue is that they all have in common a basis in food systems and power dynamics. So when we study society from the perspective of evolution, we often draw on game theory. And the basic principle of game theory is that if we want to know what we should do at any one time, we need to take into account what others are doing. Um, and so society unfolds dynamically, a bit like a chess game where we alter our strategy depending on what others are doing. So if you're familiar with game theory, you might know about something like the hawk dove game. So this is a game where hawks always use violence to get a resource and doves don't use violence. And when they compete for the resource, we can look at the payoffs, what happens when a hawk and a dove interact or two hawks and two doves. And it seems obvious that a hawk will generally do better compared to a dove because the dove's not willing to be violent and a hawk is. But we can still ask what happens when two hawks interact and they may end up with injuries. But we know in human food systems that we don't fight all the time to get our food. So we need a different kind of dynamic game. And I was very struck by what was called the producer scrounger game, which was first described by Barnard and Sibley in a journal Animal Behavior in 1981. And this game assumes that uh, individual organisms can either find food on their own or they can go and steal food from another organism that's already found the food, as you can see here for these seagulls. Um, on the left here, you can see a puffin. Um, and this puffin has a nice beak full of uh, sand eels. Now, it could consume them, in which case it would get what we call the finder's share. That's the payoff for actually bothering to go and look for food in the first place. But the problem that faces this puffin is that it, it can't consume the food because it's got to carry it back to its nesting burrow and give it to its offspring. So on the right, you can see what's waiting for it on the island, a whole group of gulls who are scroungers and who are going to try and get those sand eels. If you look very carefully, they're not actually attacking the puffin. They just want the loot. They want the food. So we can think of a society as having producer scrounger dynamics. Some produce food and some try and scrounge it. This is a graph showing the payoffs when the finder's share is quite high. In other words, the finder has a good chance of keeping a lot of the, uh, the food, the value of the food. And in those circumstances, according to the other parameters that I entered into the model, uh, we can predict an evolutionary stable strategy of 85% producers and 15% scroungers. In other words, at that point, neither producers nor scroungers could increase the Darwinian fitness by changing their strategy. And either 85% of the population could produce and 15% could scrounge, or 85% of the time for everyone could be spent producing and the rest scrounging. We can then alter some dynamics. What happens, for example, if the finder's share is lower, so there's less of a payoff for actually bothering to be a producer. Well, what immediately happens is that it's less rewarding to produce, so there are fewer producers. So you get more scroungers, 
But the problem now is that because there's fewer people producing in the population, less food is produced. So everyone gets a lower food intake under this scenario. So we can play around with those parameters and affect the uh, payoffs from the game. So what are the risk factors for producing and scrounging? Well, if you have a ubiquitous resource like grass on a savanna, there's absolutely no point trying to take someone else's grass. It's just easier to graze. But we have uh, instances where food is available in discrete and high value packages, and that's exactly the situation with the puffin. That's the kind of food resource that is highly prone to scrounging. On the right, you can see um, some terns who are fishing in the foreground, and in the background is a skewer. Once again, these terns are fishing to take food back to their offspring on the beach. And the skewer has two traits that often characterize scroungers. Um, it has intelligence and it's very agile in the air. So it has a good chance of actually getting uh, the fish uh, from the terns. So what can we do if we try and apply the producer scrounger game to humans? And I want to just briefly show how you can apply it to many different aspects of inequality, but also exploitation. So let's start with gender inequality. Now, I think there's often uh, the thought that we shouldn't actually apply evolutionary theory to gender inequality, because if we try and propose or, or, or discuss how it has uh, an evolutionary basis, we might in some sense be seeming to justify it. And so gender inequality is often studied instead through a more cultural perspective. What I want to suggest is that these don't need to be mutually exclusive, exclusive ideas. If we use evolutionary game theory, we can link that with a, a cultural perspective and actually think, what could we do to reduce gender inequality? So from the producer scrounger perspective, what is happening in gender inequality is that females are paying disproportionately the costs of producing offspring through funding pregnancy and lactation directly. And the savings that males make, the energy savings, allow them to engage in behaviors that actually maintain the activities and institu institutions that maintain the inequality in the society. If you look very closely at these two photos, it's not just that you can see one woman who's pregnant on the left and one who's breastfeeding on the right, but those two women are also engaged in productive activities, either farming or on the right, uh, the woman is breaking stones in India uh, for the road uh, construction business. So what's happening here is that although women are producing the most valuable resource in terms of evolutionary theory, which is offspring, they've actually been relegated to mundane and low value subsistence tasks. On the right here, you can see a graph uh, that shows uh, the proportion, the percentage of women who are not involved in decisions about how to spend the income that they themselves earn. So again, women are producing, but they're not gaining the payoff for that production. So we think of gender inequality as a form of male scrounging of uh, the female energy budget. And for that reason, if we think of many of the different interventions that have been proposed to address gender inequality, I would suggest that what they're really all doing is renegotiating the level of male scrounging. So interventions in different societies include preventing early marriage, promoting maternal nutrition, supporting breastfeeding, promoting girls' education, providing maternity leave, promoting norms for parental care. All of them in their different ways are trying to rebalance the investment in offspring, what tasks are under, undertaken by women and what support is provided by women as they uh, rear offspring. If we think about um, the producer's scrounger game over time, then it's very susceptible to change in association with nutrition transitions. And the first of those was the uh, emergence of large scale agriculture. This is the standard of Ur, uh, an artifact dating from around 2600 BC and uh, from ancient Sumeria. And it's a frieze depicting a feast. And you can see in the top uh, row of the feast, uh, those who are actually enjoying the feast, they've all got a nice uh, wine goblet and they're toasting um, a particularly high status uh, individual on the left. And underneath we see all the individuals who are working very hard to produce the food for that feast. So already, uh, many thousands of years ago, we can see um, depictions of the social inequality that underlay the whole food system. And farmers were inherently engaging in a risky activity because the harvest might always fail. Farmers tend to borrow at the beginning of the year, uh, either to get seeds or to get labor or to get land. And there's always the risk that the, far the harvest might fail, at which point farmers might go into debt 
and that leads to various forms of unfree labour. So producing, but not actually ending up with the fruits of that labour. And agriculture also produces food in forms that are inherently available for scrounging, either flocks of animals or harvests, which might be to haystacks or granaries. So exactly what we saw with a puffin, a discrete high value package of food that some people could come and take. And so farming also led directly to tax collection in different forms. Um, one of the things that we see with the origins of agriculture is a shift to grain agriculture because grains were so easy to collect and take in the form of taxation. And the origins of writing, which we see on this tablet from uh, Mesopotamia at the bottom there, many of those early records were of grain harvests and taxation. But alongside formal taxation, there were also other kinds of informal taxation, for example, nomadic horsemen who would just ride in and take whatever uh, food was available from a sedentary farming population. So different forms of scrounging uh, from producers. So that was archetypal scrounging in terms of the uh, origins of agriculture, different forms of tributary economy, where producers would produce different forms of food and goods and wealth, those would pass to the scroungers who would use their wealth and their power to maintain the hierarchy that coerced the unequal system of production. And we can now ask what that means in terms of health by appealing to life history theory. So we know that this theory assumes that we gain our dietary energy and we can allocate that in competition across the functions of maintenance, growth, reproduction and defense. And we can ask what happens to producers and scroungers. On the left here, we have a graph of uh, data for height from childhood through to early adulthood of laboring classes versus upper classes in England and Italy. And you can see that through uh, childhood and into adulthood, those who were actually working hard, producing food and other goods uh, had shorter height maintained into adulthood. And on the right, you can see the modern equivalent of that looking at stunting in children in the Philippines, uh, amongst the wealthiest group, there's almost no increase in stunting in the first five years of life. But for the poorest groups, and those are likely to be also those who are producing food, you see a drastic increase in stunting in the first two years of life. What about looking in more detail through the life course at Life History Tradeoffs? And here I was able to draw on my uh, long-term links with the Pilotas uh, 1993 birth cohort in Brazil which is a, a middle income setting, but nevertheless, where you still see extreme levels of wealth inequality. Here we had data, access to data on almost 3000 mother daughter diets. And we looked at the mothers in terms of what we called penalties. Um, and these penalties were the mother being short, thin, uneducated and poor. And we could count up the number of penalties um, Mothers who had no, none of those penalties were taller, heavier, educated and wealthier. And we could then compare the number of penalties with outcomes in the daughters. So if you look at zero versus poor penalties, those are essentially proxies for producers and scroungers. And you can see that for the daughters, those two groups had contrasting outcomes for birth weight, adult height, fat free mass and fat mass, but also in a reverse direction, the odds of early reproduction, school dropout, and engaging in risky behavior. So here we can see life history trade-offs that go against growth and maintenance in favor of surviving and early reproduction for the producers who are um, uh, linked with mothers with low levels of maternal capital. So we can think over time of societies as developing producer scrounger dynasties, where that scroungers uh, live in good quality conditions, they have very low levels of child mortality, so they don't need to produce many offspring to reproduce themselves in the population over time, and they can maintain good levels of health over time. The producers live in poor quality conditions, they suffer very high levels of mortality, and they have to compensate for that with high levels of fertility and experience persistent poor health. And yet, by overproducing offspring, they also can reproduce themselves across generations in the population. Now, we don't have to go too far back into our past to see versions of the producer scrounger game, which involved extreme levels of violence to coerce the producers to produce. What we've seen in more recent uh, uh, centuries is a shift where you could say, well, it's shifted from violence to hunger, but as a nutritionist, I would say, well, malnutrition and hunger 
is still a different form of violence. On the left, we have two maps, uh, one from 1700 and one from uh, 1800. The left-hand map shows common ground in an English village where the villagers could uh, go to uh, uh, pasture their, their flocks and also grow some crops. A century later, all of that common ground had disappeared, so those villages could no longer grow their own food. That forced them to migrate to cities where they became the new workers in the emerging factories. Now they had to buy their food in markets, but they had uh, extremely poor living conditions and low wages. And what prevented them opting out of that very unfair version of the producer scrounge game is that they would starve if they did. So they had no choice. So that led to a new uh, producer scrounger game involving factories and the production of new factory foods and new diets. On the right, you can see um, uh, sugar consumption in Europe between 1700 and 1950. So that sugar coming from the New World plantations, increasingly being used in diets in Europe, but also entering new industrially produced uh, food products. So that's a newer nutrition transition. So we see the reinvention of the producer scrounger game under the dynamics of capitalist economics. And this involved changing producers also into consumers. Producers now work in markets and they, they, they access their food as consumers in markets. And we see the flow of food and wealth to scroungers who once again use their uh, higher levels of wealth and power to maintain the hierarchy and the conditions that favor them. So that's led to a double burden of malnutrition. Um, so the left and middle photographs are from where I work in Ethiopia. You can see a traditional shop and a more modern shop. It's not that the left-hand shop wasn't associated with forms of malnutrition, but the middle uh, picture is showing new industrially produced foods that are changing and complicating the picture of malnutrition. And of course, the foods in those shops are to a large extent produced in factories in high income countries. I also think this perspective can help understand uh, the relationship between societies and uh, institutionalized racism and health inequalities. These are pictures of benches in uh, South Africa under the system of apartheid. And what you immediately see here is simply the different treatment of individuals in society. But what was underlying that, I think, can still be thought of in terms of producer scrounger dynamics. Because what South, South African society was producing was a supply of cheap labor uh, for the, uh, the mines in particular. And yet the families that were supplying that cheap labor were uh, in rural areas uh, where there were very high levels of undernutrition. So once again, you have symbolic categorization of individuals as producers. Those producers are producing through very hard labor, and yet they're not able to access uh, the products of uh, production in terms of being able to uh, uh, achieve adequate nutrition. And we shouldn't think that slavery, uh, which is the extreme form of the uh, producer scrounger game has vanished from the world. So we can see uh, modern slavery in every global region, and it's nearly always involved uh, in the uh, different aspects of production, whether raw materials or different components of the food chain. So we can see that whether you're a producer or a scrounger in this uh, game uh, translates into very different um, status, into different experience, into different life history trade-offs, and therefore into different uh, forms of mental and somatic health. But what I really want to emphasize here is that this is all taking place within single food systems at different levels, that the experience of the scroungers and the producers is inherently connected through power dynamics and dynamics of inequality. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we can see social gradients across many um, health outcomes. So that as you move uh, between uh, the lowest extreme to the highest extreme, many different uh, individual traits uh, vary in detail. So I've been talking about the producer scrounger game and talking about two groups because that's a convenient way of linking with mathematical models. But of course, we could make uh, our conceptual framework more sophisticated by thinking of a social ladder, how depending on where we are in the ladder, we might be producing up for those above us in the status hierarchy, but scrounging down on those below. So we could certainly make the model uh, more sophisticated. 
Perhaps the most important message of my perspective is that if we want to do something about these power dynamics, uh, which, as I've been saying, I think always relate sooner or later to food systems, what we need is interventions that don't target the high risk groups, but actually target the power dynamics and what supports them themselves. So thank you very much for listening and look forward to um, hearing your thoughts and questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jonathan, for a fascinating talk. I am looking in the chat. Uh, feel free once again to raise your hand with questions. Uh, I had a question myself, and it, it had to do with... Um, what the units are for inequality. So you've you've talked about food as being central. And when we talk about evolution, we're talking about uh, fitness. So uh, ultimately, then are we talking about sort of opportunities for fitness equality or opportunities for uh, equality of well-being? I guess I'm wondering, um, is the is 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 the goal, you know, a comparable standard of of living, or is there is really is there a specific uh, a, a specific goal that such interventions can can be aimed more specifically towards? I think the inequalities are in the health outcomes. Um, as, as I showed, you could hypothetically have a population that had stable numbers of producers and scroungers across generations, but the health experience would be very different. Um, in, in the sort of the areas that I work in, global health, public health, we are very concerned with different forms of um, health inequality, whether these are gender inequality, racial ethnic inequality, socioeconomic, socioeconomic inequality. And the question is always, well, what should we do about those inequalities? And the problem with solutions, interventions that try and do something for the group that's having the worst outcomes is that we never actually change the society that is continually producing those at-risk groups. And I think we're seeing increasing frustration with that approach, that it will be more effective to try to uh, actually change society and uh, equalize health outcomes by equalizing society itself. And um, I think whether you look at gender or efforts to tackle racism, I think increasingly the focus is on the dynamics of inequality and explo exploitation. I think there's more interest in actually targeting the, the societal dynamics that are maintaining and perpetuating inequality. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Herman Ponser. Herman, did you want to take that? Uh... Sure. There's enough in the chat too, so I don't want to jump ahead of the queue, but I'll I'll take my chance. Jonathan, always wonderful to hear your talks. Thanks for, for this one. Um, the direction you started off, well, the whole the direction of the, the talk, the, the scrounger producer dynamic. Um, if you're on this side of the Atlantic, it was hard not to hear that and, and hear all the right wing talking points uh, uh, the last election cycle or cycles um, about makers and takers and scroungers. And so I'm wondering how you would apply this or how we'd be careful about applying this sort of approach or the policy that would come from it in a way that either recognizes or, or folds in, or I don't know how you would say it, people who have been, you know, the inequality has pushed them so far that they're actually out of the workforce entirely and now are, you know, dependent on um, government programs that at least some people over here view as a scrounging kind of approach. I mean, you know, uh, I, that's that's the way it would be taught. That's the way that this would be covered uh, over here, I think, is is with that dynamic, not at the top end, but looking at the bottom end as well. So just I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So we, we have exactly the same debates in the UK. Um, people out of work as, are portrayed as scroungers from those who are, are working very hard. But um, and, and that goes also back to sort of uh, economic theorists in the 19th century, and I'm, and I'm afraid this is their legacy that um, they've, they've, 
they started this debate. But I mean, this only really comes about once we have food systems, in which case it's impossible for people to actually support themselves without some or other kind of work. Um, so if you can't farm your own food, you have to have a job. And if the job isn't there, Let's have a discussion about whose fault that is. If the market simply offers no uh, opportunity to earn your wage to support yourself. So I, I think the whole point of this approach is to turn it upside down and ask who is scrounging from who. Uh, and um, I mean, you'll, there's, there's some very good cartoons. If you, um, you know, look on the internet, there's a nice cartoon of a planet in which you know 1% of the world's population own some extreme percentage of planetary wealth but are still trying to increase their ownership of that wealth and um you know this idea of who is scrounging from who and who is owning uh the rights to subsistence if you looked at any other species there isn't a single species out there that where individual animals are not going out to obtain their food you can have some interesting hierarchies and in insects and so on but broadly uh we are a very odd species <laughs> in her, uh, exerting so much control on people's livelihoods uh, and um, ability to subsist. And that really is the contrast with hunter-gatherer populations. You do not have this control over production. So I, I don't think I'm sympathetic to the uh, idea that um, the poorest groups are scroungers on the, on the wealthier groups. No, I, fair enough. I just wanted to hear your, your thoughts on that. Thanks. We had a, a question in the chat from Barry Lennon. Barry, did you want to to ask that yourself, or shall I take it? Uh, go ahead, uh, please. Okay. The question is: um, If one pays producers for food, are they scroungers, or only theft of food would be considered scroungers? Um, well, you could say that. Um... In, in early producer scrounger dynamics, I think the scroungers literally steal food. But I think over time, they develop increasingly sophisticated ways to access the food. And um, if you do look at the origins of agriculture, debt quickly emerges as a way of controlling people. Um, we hear a lot about the evolutionary uh, origins of fairness, but the logic of fairness is what maintains people in relationships of debt. Because the fair thing to do if you're in debt is to pay the debt. Um, you could say a sensible thing if you're in debt is just to be violent and, and you know avoid it. But actually, uh, a relationship of debt usually involves people paying up. Um, and so debt is, is a way to um, uh, take from people who have very little. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an organized system of, of acquiring resources. And it may go on for a long time, interest. Uh, paying more debt than you originally uh, borrowed. Uh, so you don't always have to just violently uh, uh, steal food. The humans are very good at inventing systems where there are payments uh, in, in different forms of accounting. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Lucas Blumrich. Lucas, did you want to take that yourself or shall I? Uh Yes, thank you. Uh, so thanks for the talk, Dr. Wells. I was just wondering if you could share some examples of intervention, interventions aimed at power dynamics. Thank you. Well, I think um, any, any intervention that is trying to promote gender inequality is essentially uh, tackling power dynamics. Um, there's a lot of interest right now in combating racism. That's targeting power dynamics. Um, Funnily enough, I think when we deal with socioeconomic inequality, we see much more focus on wealth and not the power. And yet it's the power dynamics that are maintaining those uh, wealth inequalities uh, over time. And, uh, you know, underneath wealth inequality is, also, is often social immobility, which comes back down to power dynamics. So I think we should always be targeting power dynamics. Interesting. And let's see, we have a question from Johnny. Johnny, do you want to do that one yourself? 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And thanks everybody for writing uh, questions that sort of takes one, but it's like a waterfall and there's a lot of great ones. So thank you. I don't want to take up too much time. I just, I think you touched on it a lot, Jonathan, and with some of the prior statements. And then Cynthia has one that's really similar, but I was just really interested with the whole taxation concept as a, as a means of the scrounger getting more from the producer. And I think you sort of answered it in other other questions, but it's sort of another unique means of a ways to an end of increasing that disparity. So maybe I'm answering it for you, but I'm wondering if there's a proper way to do taxation because it can actually, in, in essence, produce a social benefit, which should you know, help everyone, including producers. So I think what, what needs to uh, underpin any form of taxation is some kind of social contract. If you give... Or, or have taken from your resources, the question is what do you get back for it? Um, early in the history of agriculture, what we saw was farmers become two groups, land, landholders, um, landlords, and peasants. And peasants had to give part of their harvest as some kind of tax uh, to the landholder. The question is, if the landlord doesn't look after the peasants at all, the whole system may eventually crash. If all the farmers experience a really tough year and everyone fails in their harvest now there's no food for anybody so whatever kind of food system you have if you don't nurture the producers to some extent then no one will have anything so a, a producer scrounger game has to have some kind of viability which involves the scroungers avoiding extreme scrounging but what you can see in in new world slavery and so on it was extreme scrounging um, and very high levels of mortality of, of producers. And the archaeologists have also documented uh, societies that essentially crashed under the, uh, the stress of climate change and a society that became unviable in terms of its uh, um, production. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, did you want to follow up on that? or? Sure. Uh I was wondering if another intervention would be, that might be effective, would be if somehow the producers could redirect their production to other producers, escape the scroungers, so to speak. So, I mean, there's some wonderful books written by James Scott. He, he wrote The Art of Being Ungoverned and The Moral Economy of the Peasant. And he was very interested in how, um, at various times through history, uh, producers have just simply run away. But that only works if there's someone they can run to. Um, but what they've tended to do is to return to marginal environments where they've practiced, practiced uh, slash and burn agriculture where it's really difficult to actually scrounge the harvest. You can't collect taxes easily in a slash and burn agricultural system. So where possible, producers have tried to opt out <laughs> and stop being taxed. But in many societies, there's nowhere for them to go to. And um, if they don't produce in some way, either in, for wages or for food, um, they risk themselves starving. So that's a really interesting option. Um, <laughs> whether they have to stay or whether they can go. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have Diana Sherry and then Molly Fox with questions. Diana? I can ask it for you. Uh, Diana, can you hear me? Diana asks, would you please elaborate on your rationale for characterizing women's activities in forager societies as low status? Um, it wasn't actually in forager societies, it was in agricultural societies. Uh, and what we see is a, a lot of food production, um, maintaining fields uh, and so on, um, uh, undertaken by women. It's not paid work. Also, all the unpaid care work in the family, looking after children, looking after elderly relatives, looking after sick individuals. None of this has status. None of this is... Uh, given economic value, it's not measured in GDP. And this is a, a big issue um, in women's rights research. So, so much of what women do is discounted and termed uneconomic. And the economic resources men gain from not needing to engage in these activities gives them resources that they can then use to perpetuate and maintain societies with gender inequality. 
Thank you, Anne Molly. Thank you for this really fascinating talk and, and discussion um, and these ideas. I, I was curious, um, and maybe you've addressed this a little bit, but if you could expand on how this evolutionary perspective of, of seeing um, the way inequalities play out through the, you know, the this like scrounger producer dynamic, does that perspective produce different intervention strategies than say a more sort of traditional cultural model of inequality? Um, like, can we harness this evolutionary model to have different interventions than, than we would have had otherwise? Um, I hope so. I think it, it requires that there the, the needs to be a shift in thinking. I think exactly as I was saying that so often interventions are targeted at what we call high risk groups, uh, you know, um, we, we we produce interventions for poor neighborhoods or, or households with low income. We don't really change the societal dynamics. We prop up a group who is having the worst experience. But we don't change. Next time around, we're going to have the same groups with the same uh, poor experience. Um, and I think, interestingly, racism and, and racialized societies is an area where there's growing, I think, support for actually trying to change the societal dynamics themselves um, and actually trying to address racism rather than just the victims of racism. Uh, we actually need to change the whole operation of society. That reflects the feminist movement, which has also been, uh, you know, it's given up trying to explain gender inequality. It's trying to do something about it. So um, I think there is already a history of trying to address the power dynamics, but in public health, we don't. We just distribute resources and we focus on unequal access to resources without asking why the same groups keep having unequal access. Thank you. Thank we, you. Have, we have a question from Anne uh, Lauderswipe, uh, who has managed to reach us from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Anne, did you want to take your question? Or I can read it myself. Anne, I will read it. Very insightful. Happy to be able to join from rural DR Congo despite poor networks. Any comment on the potential impact of food production systems inequalities in recurrent conflict areas, such as the Eastern DRC and in mining areas? What is your take on that? Um, gosh, that's a very uh, complex question. I, it seems to me it would link many things uh, together. Well, obviously, conflict um, is likely to have or to represent producer scrounging dynamics, um, mining areas. Uh, miners are always low rank producers, extremely risky work for uh, poor financial rewards. Um, so I'm not sure I can make a coherent comment on that, except recognize that I think if one had time, one would probably be able to find a lot of issues to explore using this framework. Thank you. Uh, Sequoia Snow, you had your hand up. Did you want to take the quest your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, and this was a really great talk. Thank you, Dr. Wills. Uh, so my question is speaking to the societal dynamics. So it's a natural instinct of like gathering um, for self-preservation and um, survive it, survival. Uh, so our we're seeing like the more limited our resources, the more people who are attempting to kind of play that game of producers and scroungers. Uh, creating more inequalities and deprivation and in, in across, you know, really, you know, countries you showed in your map. Uh, could you speak to this in terms of producer and the scrounger dynamic? Um, sorry, I wasn't quite sure if I understood the... the... Sure. Uh, the natural instinct of hoarding, gathering, a survival. And in order to exist, you kind of have to sometimes you see corporations and individuals push aside the societal caring, I guess. Um, I mean, when you see the levels of wealth inequality associated with, um, you know, big business, um, I'm not sure that 
we can link that that type of hoarding with basic subsistence. Um, so I, I yeah, I, I think uh, I, I understand that, you know, that, that anyone who's been looking at public health and corporate uh, activity understands, you know, the, the, the logic of business, the, your returns go to your shareholders, you have to prioritize their interests and everything. Um, this quickly gets very complex. Um, but uh, it doesn't really change for me the logic of using a producer scrounger lens to look at it and wonder what would happen if we changed those laws as a thought exercise. Um, right. Uh, we have uh, a Bernie, can we ask Ronald uh, Willis? He had his hand up for a while. <laughs> yes, I, I, was, I was starting on him next. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Ronald, you had one in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say um, this feels more like uh, an economist's approach to game theory. And, you know, you will probably know that John Maynard Smith was not a fan of doing that. He just felt he had to stick to the fitness version of it. So I'm wondering, does it, you know, have you had any feedback from economists as to whether it's this sort of, it feels very good, but whether it actually holds water? And also a harder question, is there perhaps a, an extended evolutionary synth synthesis approach going on here? I don't know of any models where you know, game theory has been applied to bringing in niche construction and human culture evolution. Um, this is absolutely the first chance I've had to receive any feedback on the producer scrounger game. So I'm really delighted to hear the questions and uh, tough questions are great because I think, you know, I'm trying to hopefully initiate some debate around uh, these kinds of things. I think I, I, I always like to, to sort of not see disciplinary boundaries. So for me, I never really see a wall between say economics and biology or whatever. I, I like to use methods if they help. And uh, I also think that you know, as humans, we operate in economic markets, but we also have a biology and we have health. And therefore, for me, those are all very connected. And I, what I'm trying to do with this approach is to show how our societies, which have a lot of economic logic and structures in them, get directly to our health. U using that widely used term, they get under the skin. The way that we interact in our economic structures, our institutions, our livelihoods, and so on, that's churning out our health inequalities. So for me, there's no wall. Um, if we can use game theory that was developed in part in economics, but interestingly, this game came from animal biologists. If we can use that to understand health, um, I, I won't be sort of, <laughs> I, I don't see that, that that would create any any problems. And and I, as I say, I think um, I actually contacted Richard Sibley to ask if he'd had economic models in mind when they developed the producer scrounger game. And he said, no, they were just interested in noticing that some animals stole food from others. And the game came from animal behavior. He, he told us at Sussex though, it just didn't really work because there's just too much going on in, you know, they're not rational agents, people, and it's, it was, you know, almost a fact-free zone at times in the economic world. So, I mean, I'd like to see the feedback that does come in on this paper because it feels like it addresses many areas, and I used to work in public health, but um, we'll... I think we're not economically rational precisely because we value other traits like health, like emotions. Um, so I, I would never expect humans to be ra economically rational in the first place, because I think it's a very limited way of uh, looking at humans. We have to, we have some economic constraints around us, but uh, I don't, yes, I mean, probably economists, economists wouldn't like that side, but I think I'm quite comfortable with that. <laughs> okay, thanks. We have a, a couple more from the chat, and then we'll go back to the to the to the hands. Uh, Therese Taylor, do you want to take your question from the chat, Therese Taylor? Uh, many thanks for your very interesting presentation. Can you please expand by examples of the of interventions to tackle power dynamics? Well, I think there are plenty of interventions that have tackled. Uh, 
women's experience in the world. You know, when you make an institution that guarantees maternity leave, uh, or you produce legislation that empowers uh, breastfeeding, supports breastfeeding, contrast that with the women members of parliament in the UK who get told uh, no snacking in the House of Commons. Um, legislation is, is one very important method for actually changing societal dynamics. And I think we're seeing a lot happening now uh, addressing uh, racism in the same way. Laws and, and uh, um, we can also have, you know, more community-based uh, interventions as well. Um, so I don't think there's a whole raft of uh, approaches that can be used, but I think they're most effective when they try and target society rather than individuals. Okay, we have a question from Joseph Stanford. Joseph, did you want to take it? Uh, in a multifaceted society, do you see a potential legitimate role for scroungers? That is, is there any legitimate role for government in the taxes? What would distinguish legitimate versus illegitimate scrounging? I think that's the perfect question. What distinguishes legitimate and illegitimate scrounging is what level of uh, nurturing the scroungers provide back to look after their producers. Once we're in a human food system and we actually have some kind of moral accountability, the question is for government, are you looking after your population? Um, a, a government that's looking after a society with extreme levels of health inequality can't be doing its job effectively. Um, to, the, the resources are too uh, unfairly distributed to maintain health. So uh, once we have governments, yes, they are not, they're another group of scroungers. We pay our taxes in money and um, the government funds itself and take their salaries. So they are uh, scroungers, um, but they need to give back to the producers. So what's the size of the safety net? Uh, those are all the questions that we can use to discuss whether scrounging for governments is legitimate or illegitimate. Okay, we'll take a couple from the, the raised uh, the raised hands, Baptiste and then Charlie. Baptiste. Hi. Thank you very much. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I wasn't. I will try to be brief. Uh, you have placed your framework within an evolutionary perspective, um, and once you tackle the gender inequality in uh, humans, uh, on your slide you had institutionalized or. Um, coordinated pressure from uh, male towards female. And so I was very curious, how do you see this um, framework work for other mammals? Of course, they also have lactation and pregnancy costs. Uh, we also sometimes see male dominance over females, but we don't need this extra layer of coordination to use resources to then dominate females. Uh, and so I was wondering, do you think this is just one human case of this broader framework? Do you actually see it apply in other species um, and how far? Thank you. I think that's another great question. I mean, the obvious place to start would be some of the very social primate societies, chimpanzees, baboons, and so on. And actually try and work out if males are scrounging from females, uh, as well as uh, simply, um, you know, the males and females achieving uh, fitness. Um, so I don't actually know the answer to that question, but I mean, you know, when we when I look at the birds in my garden and you ask, is there gender inequality? Um, it's a very difficult question to ask because they both achieve their fitness through rearing offspring at a nest. But then you realize there's non-paternity in the nest. So who's working hard for whose offspring? So you can have producing and scrounging in the same way, gender exploitation. Um, you can ask which of the two sexes wins that game um, in, in different ways. But I don't think this is exclusive to humans. I just think it is um, obviously a much bigger issue uh, in humans. Charlie? Yeah, thanks for a great talk, Jonathan. I really like this, this lens of the producer scrounger game. Um, my, my question is motivated by Ronald's question uh, along a slightly different line. If I remember the producer scrounger game, um, there there are a couple elements of it. One of it, it one is that the individuals choose their strategy, or that's somehow chosen over time through national selection across generations. And the other is that um, the producer scroungers have equal uh, fitness outcomes, or whatever outcome you're looking at. Um, I think that that's the case. Um, 
but of course, neither of these seem to be the case in this in this situation. And um, you know, I'm a big I'm a big believer in George Box's quote that you know all models are wrong and some are useful. And I think this is a really useful framework. Um, but I'm just wondering if you've thought about how those assumptions or or outcomes differ in your application of this game and ways that you think it the 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 framework could be developed further, um, you know, to account for these power dynamics and other things like that. So you're absolutely right that, that the animal models focused on fitness. Initially, they just looked at food, that you could get the same food either by producing or scrounging, but then they moved on to committing to those strategies and whether the fitness would be equal. So when I described that hypothetical society of dynasties of producers and scroungers, they have the same fitness in the sense that each producer and each scrounger reproduces themselves in the next generation. So they each, they each replace themselves. So that's equal fitness. But the scroungers are doing that by simply having one healthy offspring. And the producers are doing that, for example, by having three offspring of whom one, two die, and one survives in poor health and goes on to perpetuate that legacy. So you can have all of these health inequalities emerging from the producer scrounger game, even when fitness is equal. And I think that's, you know, I think we're all interested in the, in, uh, the sort of field of evolutionary public health and say, what, what insights can evolutionary theory actually bring to our health? And I think what this game contributes is an understanding of how this continues across generations. We don't solve these health inequalities. We keep reproducing them, but they don't actually impact fitness. Fitness has found its way around that by producing extra offspring for producers. So you often, another debate you often hear is, um, you know, large family size in unproductive people. Uh, you know, this is another uh, debate that, that the right-wing media are always uh, very keen on. Um, but if levels of child mortality are higher, then the incentive to produce more offspring may also be there. Um, that's something that's attracted quite a bit of empirical interest. There's some support for that um, as well. So overall, I think that the models, um, you know, it would be interesting to look at, apply some of these models over time. So you say, what, what could we do now? It would be very nice to apply some of these models to demographic data over time and actually look at how fitness does vary or doesn't vary between groups who are essentially in producer or scrounger uh, settings. That would be a very nice um, analysis. Right. I think we can uh, just try to squeeze in one more question with apologies to all the people we won't be able to get to. Virginia, uh, did you want to handle your question? Um, okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Because I have a very bad. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So I'm wondering about the role of violence. I mean, mostly you have many more producers than you do scroungers. And yet you mentioned violence in passing. And I think that, you know, it's with more producers than scroungers and some of them willing to be violent, but also some of them willing to be, you know, I'm sorry, more, more violence. I'm sorry, I'm saying that mixed up. More scroungers, more producers than scroungers. They've got to get their um, ability to exert violence from people who are producers. And so how do they motivate them to do that when in fact they could protect other producers instead of fulfilling the needs of the scroungers? So I, this is another very good question. And again, I recommend the, the works of um, James Scott, because what he found was that in the 19th century, when peasants revolted against their landlords, they didn't try and throw the landlords out altogether. What they asked was better support from them. I think the reason why uh, we've seen um, you know, recent uh, economic developments is that overt violence proves to be uh, insupportable, unacceptable uh, in producer scrounger games. And that led to the end, for example, of the slave trade. But what it's been replaced by is forms of violence that act more slowly in the body. But for me, malnutrition is a major form of violence. Um, in, in my public health work, I'm, I'm working in a lot of projects to do with um, you know, uh, child undernutrition in lower middle income countries where a proportion of those children die. 
Um, and so any other cost of malnutrition is chronic disease. So we're still seeing um, a lot of violence inflicted on producers. Um, so you could say, why would they not try and overturn the system? But, but it's very hard because um, they generally have a lot fewer resources. Right. You're speaking about a very complex system today, but when you talk about it getting started, there's still more scrounders, producers who have the capacity to use their capacity for violence in greater numbers in order to overthrow the scrounders. And so it seems like a very unstable system, at least at its start. It was extremely unstable. And if you if you look at the history of Mesopotamia, it's just nonstop war where okay. Uh, uh, non-stop uh, city-state war as groups of, you know, producer scroungers, you know, scroungers would try and invade their neighbor, scoop up more producers and build their army and their food supply and, and so on. And um, starving, you know, besieging cities to try and starve them into, into um, submission, you know, that was the standard form of, of attack. Um, so, yes, yeah, plenty of violence there uh, in history. And I, I don't think I'm advocating any form of violent solution to these dynamics. Uh, I think it's the opposite. Um, I'm interested in interventions that equalize um, and, you know, press back against all forms of violence. But do we need a model like this in order to enact the goals that I think most of us, if not all of us, share, which is greater equality? I mean, I'm not sure what I see this model really offers us in terms of achieving those goals. Um, I think if you look at Scandinavian society, they have uh, economic and social systems that are much closer to all of these goals. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, just as it happens, they have a very high tax take. They have a lot of resources flowing to the government and the government uh, uses those resources to equalize society. So we can see modern societies that are actively uh, reducing producer scrounger dynamics. So that there are models out there. On, on that note, yeah. uh, we, are, we are beyond time. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize to all the people who uh, we weren't able to get to their, to their questions. And I wanted to uh, encourage you to uh, continue to work uh, in, this, in this area and submit your work to EMPH. And if you would join me in uh, thanking Dr. Wells for a tremendously exciting seminar. Thanks very much for all the questions. And thanks for moderating and hosting, Bernie. Yeah. We'll see you at the next Club F Med. <laughs>